Hey everybody, today Rado rounds up the month of February 2020 and it was a very busy month for me and Jen, largely because we spent the final week of the month down in Las Vegas at Dice Tower West, which is a phenomenal gaming convention. We had a great time, but that did mean I was really pressed for time trying to get all of my games covered before I headed on down there. And actually it's had a knock-on effect because here I am, way late. I normally try to get these roundups out by the first of the month, but again, Dice Tower Con has basically cascaded through my life, and here we are almost a week late. Very sorry about that, folks, but um, before I move on to March with some very cool, exciting stuff, we've got to look backwards. And before I do my regular countdown of all the games that Jen and I have played and ultimately crown my new game of the month, I'm actually going to talk about a few of the games that I played at Dice Tower Con. Uh, because, well, actually, I, I played a whole bunch. We were there for four solid days, and it was almost solid wall-to-wall -wall game playing for me. Uh, several of the games I played, uh, I'll be doing run-throughs for in the uh, coming weeks, so I'm not going to bother with them. But uh, you know, the Dice Tower Library was amazing, and I was able to get my hands on a lot of fun stuff. So... Uh, let's just spend a few minutes in alphabetical order, not really ranking. What did I play that really stood out? Well, first of all, we've got Cubitos, which actually I got to see a prototype of, and I played it a couple of times, and folks, watch for this. It's going to be a really big deal. It's from John D. Clare, the designer of Mystic Veil, vale, Mr. Cardcrafter, but this game owes a lot more, I think, to all um, Alderac Entertainment, AEG's... Uh, game was oh automobiles, which was a wonderful like Daytona 500 themed bag building race game. Uh, Cubitos is another race game, and although uh, you know automobiles was you know very grounded in the real world, Cubitos is a crazy fantastical world where there's teleporters and and all kinds of stuff that you're dealing with. But what really makes this stand out is it is a bag builder without the bag. And what that means is you've got a pool full of stuff, and in a regular bag builder, you'd pull randomly to see what you get, but in this game, you get to choose what you want. Imagine a deck building game where, you know, uh, at the beginning of a round, all of the cards in the deck are available, and you can pick and choose which ones you want. But in this game, instead of cards or cubes, they're dice. So after you pick and choose what you want, you've got to roll them and hope they give you what you want. And if they don't, you can roll them again. But this is a push-your-luck game, and if you roll too much, you will definitely bust and get nothing for the entire turn. So this is a phenomenal game that mixes quite a few different uh, mechanisms uh, to make a very fun. Really, really. I, I, I cannot stress. The fun factor of this game is through the roof. I enjoyed it both times I played, and it has so much replayability because it comes with so many different cards, like automobiles before it, that fundamentally change the function of all the different dice you can um, build. Really cool. Like I said, it'll be coming later this year. I think by Gen Con, if all goes to plan, Cubitos is definitely a game to watch for. Then we've got The Crew. And now this um, really blew up last year. Everybody loves The Crew. It came out in German only at uh, Essen, and everybody who got their hands on this cooperative, imperfect communication trick-taking game fell in love. And so I've wanted to play it ever since, and I was really happy. Some friends of ours from Bits and Pips, by the way, Bits and Pips, they make wonderful board game accessories. Uh, go check them out. I did a run-through of some of their stuff earlier. You can hit that I. Anyway, they brought a copy of the crew because they knew I wanted to play it, and I'm glad they did because while there was crew um, in the uh, Dice Tower Library, it was perpetually checked out. I could never get my hands on it. Uh, but Selma and Stacy and Connie, they brought a copy. Jen and I sat down and played a couple of games with them, and I thought, Okay, I get it. I see why everybody really likes this. Because, hey, I'm all about imperfect communication, cooperation games. I think that's kind of the future of cooperative board gaming. And I, mean, I, I love that idea, and I thought it worked really well. But I really need to spend a bit more time with it. And I really want to see how it works as a two-player game. Because it has a special two-player variant where there's a dummy third player. Um, so... Uh, look for more on the crew soon because I am getting a review copy sent to me now that the English version is coming out and I'll be hopefully running through it later. Uh, so that was just like a little sneak peek of the crew. Uh, after that, oh man, folks, Mandala. Suzanne Sheldon of the Dice Tower 
basically cornered me and said, you must play this game. And I'm like, I don't want to. It's all kind of abstracting. You must. You will. And she sat down and taught me how to play it. And wow, folks. I am now trying to get my hands on a review copy of this game because it is so good. If I can get a bit more time with it and play it with Jen some, I think it might be able to push its way into my top 10 of 2019. I don't remember what game that would knock out, but I really want to get this done before April when I do my Top 10 Revisit, like I always do, because this game is a phenomenal two-player-only uh, card-drafting game all about making uh, uh, beautiful sand art, you know, mandalas. Uh, the, uh, uh, this has got to be one of the best two-player-only games I've ever played. Normally, two-player-only games really focus a lot on player tug-of-wars and punching each other and messing with each other, but this game, um, while it is an area control a domination style game. The beautiful thing is once an area gets resolved, um, just because you took the uh, you know the top prize of controlling that area, I still get stuff as well. And uh, you know it's a very live and let live game, very appropriate to the theme. And while it is still a bit more abstract than I'd like, man, I like this one a lot. Like I said, it might make um, my top ten of last year. It might push its way in. After that. Oh boy, folks. Um, I just can't stop singing the praises of Dice Tower Con because they brought... Uh, Tom and company literally trucked uh, the Dice Tower library all the way from Florida to Las Vegas. And now they're trucking it back. It's probably halfway back. Uh, but the one of the coolest things about this library, besides the fact that it's curated by Tom, so it's full of nothing but great games. There's no clunkers in there. Um, but when you check out a game, you might often find that uh, there is uh, stuff in there that they have blinged out the games. It's not just a straight game. And so when I picked up a copy of Marvel Champions, because I had a friend who was visiting who wanted to play it, and I said, hey, I'll play it with you. <coughs> and I opened up the copy I got. Lo and behold, the Miss Marvel expansion was in there. Whoa! I, you know, that's an impossible expansion to get. You gotta pay 40, 50 bucks to get this thing. But Dice Tower had gotten one and just threw one into the box. So I got to play the Miss Marvel expansion and I loved it. Um, yeah, and maybe it makes me want to play the Captain America one now. But it's so cool and it does help convince me that uh, Marvel Champions is going to have legs because, uh, you know, uh, bringing Kamala Khan in and the true source of her power is not her stretching uh, Mr. Fantastic style superpowers. The true source of her power in that game is her family. And that just like fundamentally shifts the feel of the game where you spend a lot more time when you're playing her focused on your alter ego, your day-to-day -day life instead of the superheroics. And, um, you, know, you know, and that's where she gets her source and her strength. And I thought that was great. It was so thematically perfect. Perfect, and it did make her feel different than any of the five characters that come in the boss, the, the box. I loved it. And then I went and got the other. There were two copies of it the next day, and there was the Wrecking Crew and the uh, Green Goblin expansions. So I got to play both of those as well. Um, and in fact, uh, I also ended up getting a copy of the Green Goblin expansion because there was a local game store. I got a copy. Uh, anyway, still, so, uh, long story short. Um, both of these expansions are very cool. I really liked Green Goblin. Going up against an enemy who has his own alter ego and constantly switching back and forth between Norman Osborn, his daily businessman, and his, uh, his, you know, his villainous form where he's the Green Goblin was fantastic. Really, uh, uh, fleshed out the game. Liked that one a lot. I also played Wrecking Crew, but only solo, and I'm not quite sure. I feel like you need to play that one with more, uh, you know, not as a solo. I don't think it's shown that way, so I'm looking forward to hopefully getting to play it with Jen. But anyway, yeah. So, uh, I got to play a bunch of Marvel Champions, which was my number two game of last year, and I loved it. And thanks to Tom and Co. for getting me access to all those hard to get, even if only fleetingly, all those expansions. Okay, after that, Queen of Hansa. This is one I'd heard about last year. Not a very small print run from an Asian publisher, an Asian designer, although art is from Clemens Franz, which makes it feel very much like a typical German-produced Euro-style game. And I think Clemens' art is so appropriate for this, because this really does feel like it came right out of Hans and Gluck, or Pegasus, or something like that. Often, I find Asian-developed games have a very quirky sensibility to them, but this feels very dry and Euro-y, but in all the best ways. 
It is a uh, card drafting game. I got to play it twice, and uh, it's just super sharp. Very quick game, uh, easily under a half an hour, but full of really tense decisions because every card you draft from the board is giving your opponent, uh, you know, new opportunities to take advantage of. There's kind of an area majority thing going on. A lot of really good stuff in a super clean, simple, elegant package. Like I said, I was really blown away. I hope this game gets wider distribution. I'd love to do a run through for it somewhere down the road because I was very impressed by Queen of Hansa. And then the last one, oh, not the last one, I played several other things too, but the last one I'm going to talk about today was Silver and Gold, which has been around for quite a while, but I'd never um, uh, seen it. They never sent me a review copy, and I'd wanted to try it because, hey, I love roll and writes, and I really love the idea of a roll and write where you write on playing cards uh, because everybody's got a set of cards that represent treasure maps of, you know, a deserted island where you're trying to dig up, you know, loot and all of that, and every round a uh, card comes out that tells everybody what Tetris-style shape they're going to dig on their islands. And it's a fun, fast, puzzly little game. Super sharp. And uh, uh, there's just something lovely, this tactile sense of writing on cards rather than writing on a piece of paper that you know you're going to throw away. Really clever uh, production quality to this game. I've heard a lot of people say that, oh, you shouldn't be playing Silver and Gold. You should play Project L. has the same basic idea, but um, you know, a bit deeper. Maybe that that's true, but Project L is a total abstract, and I actually really enjoyed the digging up buried treasure theme uh, that really worked its way in uh, to silver and gold. Very, very fun. And yeah, like I said, there was plenty more uh, that I played, but I think that's enough because <clears throat> you've waited long enough, folks. Let's start. Oh no, let's not start. I've got one more thing to talk about before we start the countdown. Hey! It's the Ludo Cherry uh, fashion line. This is uh, a, a, a line of clothing of geek board game geek related clothing that's on Kickstarter right now. And by the way, I should say this is not a paid preview. They did send me a shirt, as you can see, and it looks very, very sharp. It's on Kickstarter. You can learn more. Um, here's the thing that makes me You might just look at that and say, oh, that's just some kind of very colorful print, uh, you know, uh, dress shirt or, you know, collared shirt. But if you look closely, the pattern is full of board game geek details. And that's the consistent motif through all of these shirts that... Um, um, if you look close, you can see meeples or dice or gamer pieces or whatever. So it's almost like you're wearing secret gamer gear that um, you know people just walk by in the street they wouldn't even notice, but those in the know know. And that's a really cool way to you know uh, you know get your geek cred on without having to shout to the world that yeah I play board games. Um, it's a nice subtle thing and uh, it's really super high quality I have to say. Uh, personally, I'm a fan of collared shirts that still have the uh, tuck-in stuff and you don't tuck it in. Uh, these are like that new wave of, hey, it's a collared shirt that you don't have to tuck in. Which feels a bit weird to me, but it's very fashionable, very popular. I certainly felt sharp wearing it. And like I said, the quality of these is amazing. You can joke at it. Go check out the Kickstarter page if you want to know more. Right. Okay, folks. Now it is time to begin the countdown of the games of February. Um, and let's start it out with number 18, Oceans. And, folks, this is a super impressive engine builder, and really, it should be in my top five. It should be in my top three. The core design of this game, like its predecessor, Evolution, is so great, but unfortunately, it is so cutthroat, and therefore, it's a real turnoff. So, don't see its high ranking, you know, at the end of the list as any representation of the quality of this game because it is super fun, super fast. It takes the core ideas of Evolution, which was a uh, card game where players are building up species in the ancient world and having them evolve to deal with a constantly changing ecosystem that is comprised of all the other uh, creatures and species that other players are developing simultaneously. And it improves on evolution so much. I mean, it leaves evolution in the dust. Uh, from, you know, like the uh, deep evolution cards, or is that what they're called? I forget. Uh, that, you know, really mix things up. An incredibly thick deck full of amazing special powers that really change up the game every single time you play to the way they replace the watering hole. Um with something that... I think some people might miss that because it kind of takes a certain gambling element out of the game or a bluffing element out. But still, on the whole, 
Oceans is amazing, and I wish, wish, wish they would come up with a solo slash Care Bear version of rules. I actually talked about this a little bit in the video, because it could be made to be much more Care Bear, where we're not constantly just trying to mess with each other's plans, but just building our own little ecosystem, and then just uh, you know be kind of touched by dummy ecosystems that are surrounding us. Something like that would work so great. And here's why I'm excited, folks. The developers uh, saw my video, saw me complain, and I said, yeah, that's not bad. Maybe that is something we should focus on. So, fingers crossed for the future of Oceans, which is my number 18. Then we have number 17, Chrono Corsairs, which is another really sharp game that only comes in so high because it is very cutthroat. Um, I, I, you know, I, I kind of knew it was going to be cutthroat going, hey, it's all about pirates trying to uh, you know, spread their influence over an island full of, bear, full of treasures and you know, attacking each other and killing each other so you can get area majority to get all the treasures. Um, but I still want to play it anyway because of the Chrono part. This is... Uh, uh, Groundhog Day meets Pirates of the Caribbean because every round represents a day that is stuck in a perpetual loop. So if some of my pirates happen to kill some of your pirates, uh, at the end of the day, it's no big deal because the next round, the whole day resets and all your pirates come back to you. So no harm, no foul. But even still, as sharp as this is, there's a lot of really cool out-of-the-box ideas. This is really unlike anything else on the market. Um, and a very, very sharp implementation for area control at the... And a great production, too. I mean, it's really gorgeous gorgeous game with a lot of replayability, with the variable setups for the islands and all the powers that come out. I was really impressed and just kind of sat that it was a bit too uh, cutthroat for... A, yeah, literally cutthroat. They're pirates for me and Jen. The number 17, uh, Chrono Corsairs. And also, if you want to know more about that, definitely check out my final thoughts on Chrono Corsairs because I had a guest appearance um, by, from Ryan of Knights Around a Table and we had a very good very in-depth discussion. Uh, and I had a great time. You may not have seen The Last of Ryan on this channel. I'm really enjoying uh, collaborating with him. But anyway, moving on to my number 16, Dawn of Mankind. And now this is a prehistory, uh, you know, ancient uh, man tribes, you know, you know st Stone Age era tribes simulation that answers the question, what would a worker placement game be if it was on a tech tree? And the answer is very cool. This is a really neat idea where you're deploying your workers on this tech tree and instead of just moving them wherever you want on the worker placement board to do other actions, to gather resources you need to achieve goals and whatnot, you are moving them forward along a tech tree. And the beautiful part is if I move from one technological innovation to the next one on the tree and you have some workers or some cave people there, yours get bumped out so they're free for you to move again. And that's what really makes this game special. It is a super hyper-focused design on player bumping, which is one of my favorite gameplay mechanisms of all time. And I liked it a lot. My only sad bit is, I wish the developers had put a little bit more time and love and attention into two-player scaling. Because this is a game you really want to play at higher player counts. It goes up to five. So you want to play this as a four or five-player game. Because then there's going to be a lot more players bumping each other and a lot more interaction in the two-player game, the board is big enough. They did no scaling at all that it pretty much never happened. So one of the core USPs of the, of the game just gets completely lost. And I wish the developers had just done a little bit more work for dummy players or tightening up the board or something. Because it's a really sharp game. It's just, it's just a little bit too dry and chess-like at two. And um, if, 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 the, if, they had put as much work into the, the two-player count as the higher-player counts. I think this would have made my top 10 of the month easy. But as it is, my number 16, Dawn of Mankind. Then we have number 15, Space Base Shy Pluto. Which, um, which I, so you know, folks, I have not done a run-through of this, but Jan and I did play it, and um, we were very, very impressed. You may recall, I covered Space Base gosh, two years ago when it first came out. And while I really like the core, you know, dice-chucking, uh, you know, engine-building gameplay, ultimately, for us, it wasn't a keeper for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them has 
definitely been resolved, though, because uh, the original game really takes a while to get going. It's not till you're almost halfway through the game that you have been able to draft some cards that you have an interesting engine that you want to activate every round with dice. There is now... Uh, it didn't come with this expansion, but I guess with the second printing of the game, they added a, uh, you know, a hyperspeed variant for the game that basically lets you skip the first five or six rounds of the game and just go right to having a bunch of really cool cards and it just zips along and I love it. It so improves the game. And then, by the way, these rules are 100% backwards compatible if you ever bought the first edition of the game. Um, but, uh, you know, like I said, that's available. But in pursuing this, I also got to play Shy Pluto, which introduces a bunch of new ideas to the core gameplay formula, and I love them. New special type of dice, boss fights, all kinds of cool things. And what I love most about Shy Pluto is what it um, portends for the future of the industry, or for Euro games in general, because uh, John D. Clare, there's that guy again, is uh, definitely kind of following in the footsteps of Alexander Pfister, who for years now has been introducing more and more and more narrative into his Euro designs. And Shy Pluto does a great job of this. It doesn't just, you don't just open the box and say, hey, look, here's all the expansion content. Instead, you play through a storyline that was actually pretty engaging with mysterious goings on out in uh, you know, the solar system and, uh, you know, and investigating it and dealing with stuff. And I, I, I wouldn't want to spoil the story or how it's implemented, but it's really done very, very well and made uh, the overall experience much more fun and pleasurable. Very pleased with this, and I'm just glad to see more designers, um, you know, picking up the mantle that Alexander Pfister has laid down uh, all those years ago with Oh My Goods, Revolt, and Longsdale. Very good. Here's my only reason this didn't rate higher. I said right up front, there's a couple of things I had a problem with for the original Space Base. One, uh, what this to has been totally addressed: the slow startup time. Number two player scaling. Again, Space Base as a two-player game works just fine, but the core thing that makes Space Base cool, the fact that on your turn you and your dice rolls may very well activate my dice, it pretty much goes out the window in a two-player game because there aren't three or four or more players. I think Space Base increases the overall player count, or the or, sorry, Pluto increases the player count. And that's so important, and I so wish, at the same time they put in the hyperspeed variant, they had also put in a two-player official variant that says, hey, after you're done with your turn before the other player in a two-player game, roll dice to represent a dummy player, everybody responds, and uh, and then change the scaling for the way the uh, the upgrade cards, the power charge cards work. So pretend you're in a four-player game when you're playing two for the way charging works, and I think that would be amazing, and that would solve all my problems. Now, here's the thing, folks. When I played Cubitos at Dice Tower Con, I talked to John uh, about this, because he was demoing it. It's his game. And he said, yeah, you know what? You're right. I could certainly see for people who only ever play Space Base as a two-player game, that's really missing a trick, and I probably should have made some kind of official variant. I'm doing it now. Um, you know, it was unofficial because just me and him talking. But he said, "Yes, I don't think it would hurt the game at all, and it would definitely be an improvement for two-player only gamers of Space Base if you implemented what I just described." So, folks, you heard it here first. There's a new uh, variant in the works for Space Base. I can't wait to try it because, like I said, otherwise I really enjoyed Shy Pluto. But since it's not an official one, that's why it does it didn't make it into my top ten this month. Anyway, that was that was a long one. Number fifteen, uh, Space Base, Shy Pluto. Then we move on to number 14, my first paid preview of a Kickstarter prototype uh, for the month, Mind Management, which is based on a very well-loved comic book series. And I gotta say, folks, I've heard so much good stuff about this comic book, I'm gonna have to seek it out myself now, because everybody says it's amazing. But the comic book origins aside, let's just talk about the gameplay. This is really, really sharp. It is a hidden movement game where uh, one player is a recruiter moving around in a city trying to basically pick up, uh, um, you know, hit certain spots they have to do. And if they hit all their spots, they win before time runs out. The other players, or just one player, in general, if you're playing a two-player game like I did, uh, control agents trying to find this recruiter. Standard stuff we've seen over and over again, oh, and all the way back to Scotland Yard. Here's the thing that makes this stand out, and for my money, is probably the best hidden movement game the industry has ever seen, is the acceleration. The This game has such an incredible pace, uh, because every single turn that the hunters are looking for the... Uh, the, the, the hiding player, they are unlocking huge bits of information that um, you know, really restricts major 
major portions of the board and really put such a vice. Most of these style of games, hey, we might get close, but eventually the the you know, the Mr. X character sneaks through our our um our our cordon our, you know, our where we we, we tried to throw down the net they escape and now we got to spend more time finding them again uh uh in this game it's just constant drama as the noose gets tighter and tighter and tighter every step of the way and the game takes place in easily half the time of most hidden movement games and I love it also it comes with two uh, a standard and an advanced version the advanced version introduces um you know third party characters that can be manipulated by both sides uh and that's really cool too I like this one a lot Jen and I were super duper impressed. The only reason it didn't come in higher is because there's one more thing I want. I want app integration so that Jen and I can play it cooperatively. Because for all these style of games, they're never really at their best with two because there's one sneaky player who should be getting to hear all the crosstalk between all the other players in a two-player game that doesn't happen. So fingers crossed that there will be an app I've I've, I've, I've heard things. Uh, ultimately, for this game, much like Sabotage or... Oh, there was a game from Restoration Games that got an app so that you could turn it into a cooperative experience. If uh, Mind Management gets that, then... Uh, yeah, like I said, it'll be easily the greatest hidden movement board game of all time. IMO. Alrighty. That's, that's big words. And like I said, that was a paid preview. So you should take that with a grain of salt. Just go watch the run-through and decide for yourself. Anyway, moving on to number 13. The Matchbox Collection. And I talked right up front about how Dice Tower wiped me out the convention. Here's the other thing that wiped me out. This is another paid preview for a game that's on Kickstarter. So again, take my subjective opinions with a grain of salt. Um, this is a 5-in-1 uh, board game project. Uh, if you back it, you get... Eight or five great little Euro style games that's uh, all of them are solo gameable and uh, they go from one to two or one to four players, depending on which one you're talking about. They're all sharp, they're all beautiful with gorgeous art and really high quality components, but they all fit in tiny little, just oversized matchbook or you know, yeah, uh, matchbox, uh, matchbook boxes, uh, matchbox boxes, yes. Um, Anyway, uh, and they're all very, very sharp. And for me to cover them, I had to play five games. Um, oh, and it took me quite a while. I just got the run-throughs up this morning. Or maybe yesterday, I don't know when this video is going to go up. And I was very impressed by the whole package. Uh, I got, I'm bringing it in here at number 13 because there are, there's five games. And on average, I put them at 13. There are definitely a couple of the games that easily would have made my top 10. Uh, there are a couple of games that rate a little bit lower. So I'm just bringing them all right here. But I think they're all very, very good. And, you know, this is a... if. You know, if, if you're at all interested, you get a lot of bang for your buck. Because I think it comes down to each one of the individual games is eight euros or eight dollars or something like that. Um, and when you when you buy the whole thing, you'd have to go check out the Kickstarter page. I haven't really looked at that very closely, but I can say that you know I played a lot of these at Dice Tower Con with all the player counts, and I mean. It's hard, I'm hard pressed to imagine a better um, you know value for investment because you get so much variety with all these different games and they're all very well considered and all very very different while still being Euroy. Um, and anyway, again, that was a paid preview. Uh, a subjective opinions. Go watch the five run-throughs I killed myself to get done and decide for yourself if it looks like fun because, hey, it's, that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. But anyway, that is sitting at number 13, the Matchbox Collection on Kickstarter now. Then we have number 12, Public Market. Another paid preview. This is another Polyomino Tetris style tile laying game. And it is very sharp. What I like about it the most, it's a, a fishing simulation. Fishing in the Northwest, bringing your haul in, selling it at the Pike Place Public Market. They never say it, but I think that's what they intend it to be, which I love anyway, because I've been there so many times. I've seen the guys throwing the fish around, so I have kind of a personal nostalgia connection to it. But all that aside, this is a very good Tetris-y polyomino game, because like last year's excellent Isle of Cats, which is really catching on fire right now. This is a game that doesn't just stick to the basic Tetris pieces of the S and the L and the O and the long straight. This has bigger pieces that make it very, very tricky to puzzle them all together on your little board. And your little boards, there are spaces you want to cover, there are spaces you aren't allowed to cover, there are spaces you want to surround. And um, as you're drafting to try and get these tiles to fill up your icebox full of fish the best you can, with all 
also a really great auction system that works really, really well with two. Man, it comes together so well. Uh, the only thing that keeps it from rating higher is Jen and I did find it was very AP, analysis paralysis prone. It really grinded ge Jen's gears. And I think about it, it didn't occur to me at the time, but somebody mentioned on my um, final thoughts that maybe the reason for that is because to make the two player auction work, um, you can often get yourself in a situation where players, uh, you know, in a two player game, it kind of replicates a four player game where each of us are going to take two turns per round. And that can give you a lot more control over what you're drafting for and what you're trying to puzzle all together. And maybe played at the higher player counts, it wouldn't be quite so AP prone. I don't know. I've only played as a two player game and I really enjoyed it. You know, like I said, the only thing that didn't kept it out of my top 10 of the month, was for Jen, it was almost overwhelming. But I mean that in a good way. It is so surprisingly deep. Trying to puzzle this stuff together with an eye towards getting back to the market and selling these things to the best return, depending on what the contracts with the local restaurants are. And those are constantly appearing and disappearing. Super sharp game. Very impressive. That's another paid preview for public market. Again, go check out the run-through. Alrighty, number 11 is Liftoff. And I just gotta say, folks, the whoever, whatever they, they're putting in the water over at Hans and Gluck, these folks just cannot fail. Year after year after year, they just keep putting out amazing insanely solid, well-considered Euro-style games um, that just sadly seem to always kind of fly under the radar. And uh, Liftoff is the latest. Actually, to be fair, I think it came out several years ago. It only just got its English version last year. And this is a, another golden era of the Space Race-style game. Uh, and it is a card drafting game. You know, think Sushi Go or Seven Wonders, uh, where we're drafting at the beginning of every round to get all the resources we need to hire personnel and whatnot to be able to run our space agency to lift off and launch missions and score points. And everything about this game is ju it just sings. It is just flawless, smooth, elegant Euro perfection. I think the thing that really makes it stand out that is most special about this game is the way they handle drafting. Because unlike most games where, hey, we all draft a card and we keep it, we reveal, and then we hand it the rest. You know, basically the pattern that Seven Wonders has ingrained into every designer's head. This game mixes it up. Yes, I take a card, give you the rest, and then you give me some, and then, oh, look at this new stuff. <gasps> I like this better than this. This card I kept, you don't have to keep it. You can change your mind throughout the draft and constantly be reevaluating. And that's good because there are actually a couple of drafts that happen every round for different types of cards. Really good stuff. Just misses the top 10. Um, but it's totally for us a keeper. And I gotta say, I was starting to get to the point where I was thinking I was kind of burned out on all this golden age of space race stuff. But um, Hans and Gluck changed my mind uh, with my number 11 of the month, Liftoff. Then... Number 10, we've got Deadly Doodles, which sadly I don't have a run through for, um, but is, so you'll just have to take my word for it. This is another game. Actually, somebody else at Dice Tower Con bought a copy of this. And they said, hey, Rado, what you playing? And we played whatever game. And I said, hey, you just bought that. I want to play it. And so we just got it out, read the rules, played it, and loved it. Loved it. And Jen, who was, you know, working her booth selling glassware, she could see how much fun we're having. I want to play that game. And so we immediately went and bought our own copy of it. And that aim, I must have played it over a half dozen times. Um, because it is such an incredibly fun, compelling, uh, you know, like popcorn. Uh, you know, or like, like um, you know, you know how when you get the uh, bubble wrap and you just pop, 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 and it's just like compelling and compulsive? This game is like that. It's so fast, it's over in five minutes, and you just want to play again immediately. Wipe your board down, play again. It's a dungeon crawl. It's a bingo-style game where every round, four cards come out to tell us what types of paths we can draw. Think uh, rail, uh, uh, Railway Inc., which was an, an, another excellent example of this. This is kind of like a fantasy dungeon crawl version of that. And um, Or think Cartographers, another example. But unlike Cartographers, while there is a little bit of player take that here, the most brilliant thing about this game is you keep everything you do secret until the end of the game. Because one of the things you can add to your dungeon, because we're all exploring the same dungeon, uh, you know, when certain cards come out, it says, oh, add a trap. And I have to decide, where am I going to put this trap? Which means I can't travel to that space in the dungeon anymore. But if any other player travels to that space, they will lose some points. 
That's so sharp. When everybody at the end of the game, we reveal, we all see what we've done, and we see, oh no, you hit my trap, and I hit two of your traps, and stuff like that. Very sharp, really fun. Apparently it's going to get a sequel, which is the only thing this is missing is more dungeons. That's all I want to see, because the core gameplay is great here. Super fun, super fast. Like I said, I played. we played it at a restaurant. Um, Jen, we, we I constantly had a game going, because uh, it was something that Jen could just sit down, we play a couple rounds, then she sell, you know, deals with another customer who wants to buy more glass, and then we pick it up. Great, fun stuff. My number 10 of the month, Deadly Doodles. Sadly, you'll probably never see me do a run-through because I bought it myself, and these days, I pretty much just have to focus on the games that publishers send me for review copies. But, folks, wow, so much fun in this little box, Deadly Doodles. Then we move on to number 9, Enchanter's East Quest, which is another paid preview for a game that's on Kickstarters. This is the latest expansion, although it is, does work as a standalone game for Enchanters. And, uh, hey, just go watch my previous run-throughs of Enchanters to know how much Jen and I love this uh, fantasy card drafting game. I was very, very happy uh, because a lot of the cards that come in the expansions end up being very aggressive and cutthroat. And the same is true here for East Quest. But for any one of those, uh, that you can use the app to play it cooperatively instead of competitively. And um, yeah, this is just more cool new ideas in the box. Um, you know, just go watch my video to, to, to see how it changes up the core gameplay. Um, one interesting thing, though, is, uh, you know, since it is set in the Far East, this could have been called Enchanter's Kung Fu Panda, because for the first time, they did, I mean, everything is based on anthropomorphized animals, which funnily enough, is still very, very consistent with the artistic stylings of the previous uh, games. But like every expansion that's come out up till now, surprising cool new ideas abound that make you just reevaluate how to play Enchanters, which at its core is just such an, a wonderful little card drafting game. Love it to pieces. The latest expansion, which is on Kickstarter now still, I think, remember this was a paid preview, is available. So that's my number nine of the month, Enchanters. East Quest. Then, number eight is Stellar. This is a very simple, kind of abstract, but not really, I think the theme is there enough, game, a uh, card game, where we are drafting cards into our hand to play them to our board to score points. The theme is we are amateur astronomers charting the nighttime sky, trying to play cards that represent all of the interstellar phenomena we see, and we also play cards to a notebook, which is kind of a set collection thing, and at the end of the game, we multiply the value of our notebook times the value of the stuff we've actually observed. So we're kind of building two separate sets of cards that interact with each other. The most brilliant thing about this game is every time I uh, I, I uh, play a card, because remember, uh, you know, in a round, I am going to play two cards. One to my nighttime sky observatory, my telescope, and one to my notebook. The first card I play, I take from my hand and I play it. Wherever I play it, there's a number on every card that says, okay, because I played this card over here and it was... The, the 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 three that means I draft card number three from the common supply, and it goes into my other thing. So if I play to the telescope, the card I end up drafting goes into my notepad. That sounds simple. It sounds like it's not much, but oh my gosh, that creates such a ugly little challenge uh, to solve every round, because every time you're playing a card, it's effectively a multi-use. I play this card, I really want to play it over here in my notebook, but if I play it over here, that means I could grab this card and put it in my notebook. What am I going to do? That's the last one of this, and if I don't get them, I'm going to miss out on a huge scoring potential. And there's actually several different ways to score as well, so you can change a lot of different avenues to victory, or paths to victory. And yeah, it's gorgeous. It sadly does take up a little bit more table space than I would like, but that's my only complaint, and otherwise an absolutely flawless little uh, card drafting game. Number eight, Stellar. Then we go on to number seven. Is this my last one? No. This is uh, my next to last Kickstarter paid preview of the month, Masters of Charms. And I gotta say, folks, if Jen were here uh, telling you her top one of the month, this might have made her number one spot. She loved this game 
so much. After we played the first time, she immediately wanted to play it again. Set it up, we're playing again, and then immediately wanted to play it again. That doesn't happen very often, but this one, uh, at its heart, we are master we're trying to create magical charms by mixing together different gems uh, that we have drafted from a central supply. The supply itself is a grid, and we have a little character who moves around. It's like you're a gnome moving around within a gem mine trying to pick up all these gems so that you can set, collect, and make charms and score points. The thing that's really interesting about this game is we don't just walk around the gem mine. We open portals. <clears throat> because some of the cards in our hand are portal cards that say how we can move around, whether we can move two spaces or three spaces. And so I've got all these different cards that let me know where I can go. I've got to figure out where I'm going to go. But when I open a portal, I leave that portal open. And then I end up in the new place. I draft a card. Maybe it's another portal or, you know, or, or, or whatever it might be. Um, and uh, Or actually, no, it's not another portal, but it's a gem or it's money or, or stuff like that. I've left that portal open, which means over the course of the game, we end up having all these open portals on this thing. And if a player can work it out, so, hey, I'm going to teleport to land on a space where there's that portal, I will then, you can get this amazing, if you watch my run-through, you can see this happen, this incredibly satisfying chain effect of, I bounce from portal to portal to portal to portal to portal to portal to portal, and every time you do that, you're picking up uh, like uh, portal magic that you can basically convert into points, and it, it, it feels like ping pong. Or not ping pong. It feels like pinball, I meant to say, as you just carry them all over the board once you've set up this awesome chain effect. And you know, everybody can see it, and everybody's going for it, and you're just picking up points along the way, and you ultimately end up where you're going, and you draft that next card. And like I said, it is super compulsive. Very fun, easy game to play, fast to teach and set up. And like I said, Jen loved this one. I liked it a lot too, but Jen loved it so much. Um, it is, what which one was it? It was my number seven of the month. Alrighty. On to number six, Mechanica. This is an engine building game that I, after I was done playing it, I realized I love conveyor belts. I never realized this before, but I am deeply, deeply in love with board game conveyor belts because that is such a great way to represent engine building. I am building an engine that um, is represented by this thing where I'm going to take resources and send them through all the different stages of my conveyor belt and convert and modify and duplicate and eliminate elements of that thing and they come out the other side to uh, great effect so I can score points. Uh, there have now been several games that I have played and I never realized, wow, I just really like conveyor belts. Uh, I talked about them in my final thoughts for this, but of all of them, I do think this is my favorite. Although Chocolate Factory, I've only played a prototype of that. Chocolate Factory might eclipse it if I ever get a review copy. Copy, but we'll save that for another day. Mechanica, though, is very sharp. It is a game where we are making automation robots for our future of humanity where nobody has to do drudgery housework. Although, unbeknownst to us, the robots want to destroy us. But that's just like a little fun side thing. Just kind of a lot of gags in the, in the flavor text of the game. But the engine building here is super sharp, and we like it a lot. I think one of the things I like about it so much is it's a very short game. You have a very limited amount of time. This game does not overstay its welcome. And I have seen some people complain that the game is over too quick. Just when I got my engine and I've run it a couple of times, it's over and I want to keep running my engine. And that, no, I love that. I love that tension of can I pull off what I need to do before? Because the engine, the end is always coming very, very soon. And also, I do think people who think that are maybe not properly evaluating the worth of certain actions you can do. You can say, hey, you know what? If you've made an overly complex machine that's going to take a lot of time to move your widgets through, maybe you're not going to get to run that machine very much and you should try to modify it to find ways to speed it up because you can. And um, But you know, I, I think those lend themselves to kind of deeper, more subtle strategies that you'll get the more you play the game. Anyway, folks, I, I think the presentation is great uh, and you know the sense of humor is great, the engine building is great, and the conveyor, are, or conveyor belts are great. And my number six, Mechanica. Then we have number five, Rush MD, which is a sequel to a game I covered a few years ago uh, Kitchen Rush. It's a real-time cooperative game. Before, we were all working in a restaurant, trying to work in the, behind the scenes in the kitchen to make meals to serve the customers who had specific needs. Now, it's the same core idea. We are working in a hospital, in the emergency room, in the OR, in the pharmacy, trying to get everything together to be able to serve the need of patients who come in. It is cooperative. It is real time. It is a worker placement game where our workers are hourglasses. And once I put a worker and do the action, I can't use that worker again for another 30 seconds. 
It is a blast. Go watch my run through where Jen joined me and the two of us tried to keep our hospital afloat. It is just laugh out loud funny and uh, we really, really enjoy it. And honestly, I think it's better than Kitchen Rush. I've thought a bit more about it since then. I do think probably the biggest change, because there's a lot of subtle changes. I'm putting aside, you know, the setting and the art and the production. And I mean, the components in this game are awesome. Real syringes and stuff like that, which may sound scary, but again, go check out the run through. But the fact that, um, Kitchen Rush had the this idea of, oh, I've got my personal workers, you've got your workers, and then there's like a neutral worker that everybody can use. They flipped it on the script. Now I've just got one personal worker, and there's a bunch of neutral workers that we share control of, and that really opens up the game and is a huge improvement on what was already a really stellar game, which is why it makes my number five of the month, Rush MD. Then we move on to number four, uh, Teotihuacan, the late pre-classic period, which I don't know if this is the first or the second. I think it's the first expansion for Teotihuacan. On, which I uh, made my top 10 of the year two years ago, I think. Anyway. This is a great expansion for an already great game. And actually, you might be saying, hey, where's the video? Actually, I, I haven't put the video up because when Paulo checked out, he I haven't gone back and looked. He said, wow, you really goofed up a storm when you did this run-through. So I'm thinking I might refilm it, but I have to go check what my goofs were. I suspect they're just dumb little... There's nothing like core mistakes. Because here's the thing. Um... Uh, because I did a run-through, and I've already covered uh, Teo Bukan, I decided to have some fun, and I actually uh, did a solo run-through. So not only was I showing um, the new contents of the expansion and how it really... Re There's five modules, although really only four. And they fundamentally change some of the core precepts of the game in a great way. And I demonstrate all that, but I also get to demonstrate the Teobot, which was available in the base game. And I had a lot of fun playing it, but apparently uh, I made a few goofs here and there because it was literally, I was filming myself playing it for the first time. Anyway, you'll see this shortly. Uh, whether I refilm it or not, I, I gotta go check. Uh, Paulo said it's okay. He said it's okay for public consumption, but I gotta double check. Anyway though, about this expansion. There's a bunch of, you know, unique player powers and, um, you know, new boards you put on and stuff like that. A whole new different temple track. Lots of cool ideas. But there's one central element that I think is hugely important that really addresses a shortcoming of the original game. In the original game, um, it was very, very... You know, basically, people don't worship, which is a really important element because if you uh, lock your dice into worship spaces, which gives you uh, access to really cool powers, your die gets stuck. And it won't... Unless you spend a lot of resources, either time or cacao, to get them unstuck, you really lose your workers, and that just scares people away. And it's okay because what's supposed to happen is this is a bumping game, like I talked about earlier with uh, uh, Dawn of Mankind, where, hey, I'm bumped... I'm, I'm stuck here, but somebody else will come here and bump me free. Nobody bumps anybody. Uh, and it, a huge part of what makes the game special is lost. Or my original run-through, I complained, man, this really sucks, it never happens in a two-player game. Apparently it doesn't happen to any player count. And that's really disappointing. A big, uh, a big black eye for an otherwise flawless design. So here's what this expansion does. Um, they basically introduce new boards we can put on the board that, hey, when I do certain types of building actions, I can, if I do them at the right time, I can unlock my people who are stuck and I don't have to waste all those resources. And that's very sharp, and that goes a long way towards addressing the issue that um, worship, which is a big part of the game, is just not as attractive as it should be. That said, I'm disappointed. I don't think they did it the right way. As a former game designer myself, I think there's a better way to do it. I talk about it in the video. So even though I disagree with the choice they made, I'm still glad they did it because in the end, they did make Teotihuacan a sharper design overall. And that's why it's my number four of the month, the late pre-classic period. Let me move on to number three. My last paid preview uh, for a Kickstarter game of the month. And the best one as far as I'm concerned. I would say Jen probably considers her second best. Although again, paid preview. Um, grain of salt. Anyway, Tumble Town is such a wonderful engine builder. Uh, this is a card drafting game where every time you grab a, a new card to add to your potential blueprints that you are going to use to build up an old west uh, you know, pioneer town, you also end up grabbing dice, adding to your pool of dice. You roll those dice, add them to your pool of dice, and hope that the dice you roll, the values you roll on those dice, will actually allow you to build the blueprints that you drafted. And if you do, you unlock special powers that just enhances and accelerates that loop and it is good. Just that would be good enough and put it on equal ranking to like Fantastic Factories or other really sharp uh, engine builders. Um, but this goes above and beyond because 
after I successfully build the building and I get the special power that's going to help me for the rest of the game, the actual little sculpture of the dice that I use to build the building, which is like a little 3D thing. You stack them up and make different shapes to match the blueprints. Those dice get put on a main street. And um, if you can match the what the people of this main street want, put the right color dice or the right height dice in the right place, you can get even more points. That extra little bit pushes this over the top and makes it so wonderful and puzzly because there's like three different things you're considering with every single card you draft in this game. And then you got to roll the dice and the game gives you tons of dice mitigation uh, to be able to deal with it. Also, not for nothing, this comes with an excellent solo mode, a phenomenal solo mode. It makes it great. I filmed it uh, playing by myself and had a blast playing it. But Jen, I loved it a lot too. It's my number three of the month, Tumble Town. Now, number two is another expansion for a top 10 of uh, years gone by. Last year, if I recall correctly, Tiny Towns, I think, made my third best. Maybe it was my fourth best game of the year. Its first expansion, Fortune, has come out, and this is a great expansion. It does what I really want more than anything else, more new buildings with uh, cool effects that you can just mix and match with all the other ones. That's really all I wanted, but it does go a bit farther. It introduces a new resource to the game money. The little forest anthropomorphized animals that we're making tiny towns for have discovered commerce. And so one of the things you can do now is collect coins. Um, and you can use them for different things. One of the most important things is if the... Uh, the resource you have to draw, depending on which mode you play in, whether you're playing the bingo style one or the standard rules, every round you're going to have to get a new resource, stone or wood or whatever, and put it somewhere onto your tight little tiny town and start trying to build up more stuff. And you know, eventually you get squeezed out and it's a very challenging, fun game. The um, What happens now is as you earn these coins, you can spend them, thereby throwing points away, to override what you would have to do normally and put whatever you want on your board. For some people, that's great because it means it gives you more flexibility, more control, and an interesting decision. Am I going to sacrifice points, these coins are points, to be able to get the exact resource I need at the right time and not get myself stuck in a corner? That's cool. I have to admit, though, I like the game the way it was. This makes Tiny Towns a much more forgiving game where you won't destroy your own plans based on a lack of foresight. Um, and it, just, it makes the game more easygoing and forgiving. I think for a lot of people, that's a great thing. And so it's probably for the best that Tiny Town introduces fortune. For myself, when I played with it, I kind of missed the just like, gut-wrenching decisions. Oh my gosh, I've got nothing but bad decisions here. Now, with the fortune, hey, I'll just spend some coins and I can make a good decision all the time. Uh, so for some people, that might really enhance the quality of the game. And don't get me wrong, I still enjoyed it. Hey, it's my number two of the month because Tiny Towns is still excellent. That's Tiny Towns Fortune. And my number one of the month, folks, Castles of Burgundy, the 20th Anniversary Edition. Which is not the 20th anniversary of Castles of Burgundy. It uh, just came out, what, 10, 12 years ago. Uh, but it's the 20th anniversary of Aaliyah, the publisher. And so, to celebrate their 20th anniversary, they did, you know, Castles of Burgundy is by far their biggest game of all time. It is one of the most important Euro designs in the entire modern, uh, you know, industry. It's it's my favorite Steffen Feld game, and, it's, and Steffen Feld is my favorite board game designer. I've always loved it, and I'm happy to see it getting, you know, a deluxe reprint treatment. Um, and so Jen and I, we got to play it, and I fell in love with Burgundy all over again because I hadn't played it for a few years, and oh my gosh, it's still so great. Um, so, Burgundy is awesome. What uh, else, though, about this new 20th uh, anniversary edition? Well, the big thing is it's gotten a complete and total graphical makeover. Some people love it. Some people hate it. I'm kind of in the middle. I personally always liked the spare elegant, reserved look of castles, the original castles of Burgundy. A lot of people thought it just looked as dry and boring and as the game itself is. And so I think a lot of people are going to be very happy that it is very bright and saturated and colorful. And not enough people point this out. I really appreciate this. The trade goods uh, tiles are now actually individual trade goods, like grapes for wine instead of just generic crates. So the game is not generic anymore. It does help the theme come to life a little bit more. Um, but again, some people like me maybe prefer the classic understated elegance of the original, but I'm totally fine with the new um, bright popping version as well. I, I think they're both 
totally fine. It's just subjective opinion which one you like better. A lot of people are super happy about the fact that the tiles that come in this game are nice, proper thick. The original Castles of Burgundy, which is like one of the cheapest euros. I mean, it's perpetually under, uh, depending on your country, under 20 bucks or 30 uh, pounds or whatever, because its costs were so low, because they had really cheap components. Super thin tiles. Um, you know, cheap wooden dice, I think, if I recall correctly. And so, all the components are, you know, much more consistent with what you expect uh, from modern d uh, designer Euro games. Thicker uh, wood, you know, uh, you know, a uh, lusher, richer art and all that. I could take it or leave it. I was always happy. I was never bothered by the lower quality components. Although I know a lot of people are very, very happy about that. Although that one thing is weird. The components on the whole have been improved. But the box itself has it's it feels like it's almost made out of tissue paper. Um, my copy that showed up in the mail was super crunched, even though it was really well packaged with a lot of you know air bubbles or you know air pockets, air pillows, um, and yet it still just got completely munched because the box itself is super thin and weak. I've never felt a box quite like it. Tissue paper is overstating it. I mean, it, it is rigid, but just barely. And I don't, that's weird. And unfortunately, that means mine doesn't have a good shelf presence because unfortunately, it got crunched on the side that would face out. Eh, anyway, whatever. So, uh, you know, I guess the, you know, the quality of the components, hey, you're going to love it, you're going to hate it, whatever. But the more important thing is this anniversary edition collects almost. Originally, it was promised all, but now it's almost all of the various little promo style expansions that have come out over the last decade. And that's really great because a lot of these things are very, very difficult to get. Um, so if you're thinking about, should I get the original or the new one? Totally get the new one. Even if you would prefer the classic understated uh, of the original and you don't like the look of the new one, get the new one anyway because it comes with so much stuff. All these alternate boards and game-changing uh, promo rules that are fun. All of them are fun. And don't believe anybody when they say, oh, you should just introduce them a few at a time. If you know Burgundy, you can just throw them all in and have a great time. More importantly, there is one completely new expansion. They're called Banners or Flags or something like that. That really um, introduces a whole new element to the game because now, if anybody rolls doubles, you have the option of, instead of just taking tiles, to take these banners that you have to put on your castles that give you super powerful abilities for the rest of the game. But at the end of every round, you have to pay silver to maintain them. And that's before you get silver. So they can become very burdensome to maintain, but they are so powerful. And they really introduce a great sense of drama. Whenever um, doubles come up, oh my gosh! I was going to do this other thing, but doubles don't come up that often. I should totally do this. I love the banners. The banners, even if you hated everything else about this new version, they're worth getting because they really, really add something fresh and new, and I love them. Um, and that said, I know some people are going to be upset because there's a couple of boards that aren't in this box because there were licensing issues, I guess, so they couldn't package them in. But that's a pretty minor complaint. There's so much to love here. Uh, and like I said, I fell in love with uh, Burgundy all over again. And that's it, folks. Boom! 18 plus other stuff. New games that uh, Jen and I uh, enjoyed for the month of February with... No surprise, Castles of Burgundy being my number one game of the month. Of course it would be. And thanks once again, folks. And join me again in just three weeks, because hopefully I'll get my schedule back together, and our next roundup for March will show up uh, at the end or the beginning of... or at the end of March or the beginning of April like it should. And, uh, although, man, it's going to be scary. I've already lost a week trying to catch up. And uh, there's so much stuff i got to cover. Which if you want, you can go to comingsoon.rado.com and see. You can always go to comingsoon.rado.com and see what's coming soon on my channel. But, phew. Okay, now i got to go edit this thing, which is going to take forever. But otherwise, folks, have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye bye